What are ganglion cysts? Who gets them? Are they dangerous? Do they matter? How should we manage them in primary care? If you've never aspirated a ganglion before, I'm going to teach you how. I'll cover what equipment you need and don't need, tips on getting it right, patient selection on what to tell your patient. There are a few things to avoid, which includes taking a heavy book like a Bible and hitting it hard. What could possibly go wrong with that? Hold on a minute. This is a channel devoted to primary care demoscopy. Why teach how to aspirate a ganglion? It's because when you tell people, I'm a primary care demoscopist, you'll be getting more of these. If you have the skills to take a patient's blood, you already have the skills required to aspirate a ganglion. They are cysts filled with a gelatinous fluid with a consistency similar to synovial fluid. Most arise spontaneously. There's no consensus on their cause, but Eller in 1746 suggested they were caused by the herniation of synovial tissue from a nearby joint or tendon sheath. It's as good a theory as any, and they are more common when there's trauma to a joint, such as in gymnastics or when there's arthritis due to age. Think of it a bit like this. What we're going to do is, hopefully your patient doesn't explode, but it's the same principle with aspiration. Usually they're easy to diagnose due to their typical location being smooth and round with the normal overlying epidermis skin being one to three centimeters diameter and they can transilluminate with a the light. They can occur alongside any joint in the body but are most common in the following locations. 80% in and around the hand including the wrist, 20% elsewhere in the body, not uncommonly the dorsum of the foot or the toes. Patients present not just because they're sometimes worried about cancer, but often because of their cosmetic appearance. And around 20% of patients will have pain and symptoms of discomfort due to the size and location of the cyst. They are otherwise harmless and can be safely left alone with no reports of cancer ever having arisen within the ganglion. There are no long-term consequences. And my search of the literature suggests around 50% disappear on their own spontaneously within about five years. When I diagnose a ganglion clinically in my patients, there are three things I discuss with them. First, I reassure them, and that can often be enough. It's called masterly inactivity, invoking the medical wisdom of first do no harm. If it's not causing problems, it's not dangerous, and has a good chance of being self-limiting, why interfere? I discuss aspirating the ganglion with them. Recurrence rates are approximately 55%, but one study reported a recurrence rate of 15% by repeated aspirations up to three times. But success rates decreased with those needing repeat aspirations. After I've aspirated ganglion, I do not add steroids or sclerosing agents ever. The evidence of benefit is poor and steroids risk fat atrophy within the patient's skin tension and skin hypopigmentation. This is especially important in patients with skin of color. The third thing I tend to mention to patients is surgery. There is arthroscopic and open surgery. Here are the recurrent and complication rates for you. Note, there is not a 100% certain way of preventing a recurrence. If you're enjoying this video, just bump the thumbs up button now to encourage me to keep making more videos. Know the criteria for referring a ganglion for surgery in your location. Here in the UK, I quote from a document which says this. However, what does it mean by a significant pain or disruption in daily activities? My test questions are, does it disturb my patient's sleep regularly? Is it interfering with their job? Or are they getting symptoms on a daily basis? If yes, an aspiration is declined or isn't working, I will discuss referral for surgery. However, you'll probably need to write an IFR or individual funding request to your local ICB to get financial permission for a referral. If the referral is for cosmetic reasons only, it would need to be funded privately. Why offer aspiration of the ganglion? Firstly, by removing the sticky contents of the cyst, I confirm the diagnosis. Secondly, it's a treatment with a... Ugh. It's a treatment with a... 50-50 chance of curing them. Not bad odds for a simple and quick procedure. The majority of ganglion will be on your patient's hands in these locations. The back of the wrist is the most common. There's nothing much there anatomically to prevent an aspiration safely. Distal finger joints also are very common. This is the proximal and the distal interphalangeal joint. Sometimes a very small cyst near the distal interphalangeal joint are called mucoid cysts. And if pressing on the nail matrix can deform the nail. If it's small, you can just do a little needle puncture and express the contents and that will often work for those. Notice on the volar surface of the hand, it's not uncommon the palmar crease to get small little ganglia attached to the tendon sheaths. Ganglions here tend to be firmer and they could be tendon nodules, in which case your needle will bounce off them. I often warn the patients about this, but very often it is a ganglion and aspiration will do the job. You may have noticed this red one. 
There are a few ganglia sometimes on the volar surface of the wrist at the base of the thumb. Why don't I aspirate ganglions here? Anybody? It's because it's tiger country. You've got the ulna and the radial artery, along with the median nerve going into the hand. If it's here and causing symptoms, I'd refer to a hand surgeon, because often this is best done under ultrasound guidance. Do you know Alan's test of the circulation of the hand? Let me show you, and you can follow along at home. Here we've got the ulnar artery, here we've got the radial artery. Now if one of them is blocked, the other will still supply the hand. However, if you've got a ganglion here, it can compromise the artery. And you can check the circulation using Allen's test. You apply compression to the two arteries, the ulna and the radial. And then you squeeze your hand like this. And what you're doing is, you're stopping blood going into the hand, and by doing this, you're getting rid of the blood, and it'll be white. And then what you do is you release one of the arteries, and it should flush back. We'll do the other side. Press both arteries, empty the circulation in the capillaries within the fingers, and then this time, I'm gonna lift up the ulna nerve and let that, and the hand should flush pink. Try it yourself and see if you can check your own hand circulation using the hands test. Are we now ready to aspirate that ganglion? Almost. Some people use to sign consent form, if you wish, but I do it verbally and record in the notes what I've told them. I keep this plastic box with me in my medical kit at all times, so I'm always ready, even on a home visit. There's then no scrabbling around in a busy clinic trying to find what you need. It's all there already. I also do joint injections, so I use this kit for those as well. Let me now walk you through the process I use in aspirating my patient's ganglion. I arrange the patient so the limb with the ganglion is stable and won't move. I do a no-touch technique, which means I have cleaned the ganglion with an alcohol swab, especially where I'm going to puncture it with a needle. I have my gloves on. I have chosen my needle and syringe as follows. A 10 mil syringe is needed as any smaller and the suction usually isn't enough to draw out the gel like contents. A 21 green gauge needle or larger is needed, smaller and it won't work. I offer a local anaesthetic using 1% xylocaine and a small 25 gauge needle but explain that it stings and little benefit over a straightforward puncture. 9 out of 10 patients opt for a straightforward aspiration without anaesthetic. If you are however using a larger gauge needle, bigger than a 20 one gauge, I'd be recommending a small local anaesthetic injection as that would be more painful. However, with a green needle, it is quite straightforward. I warn the patient about a sharp scratch coming. Keep still and aim for the centre of the ganglion with the needle end. I penetrate the ganglion horizontal to the skin surface and not vertically into it. This is so if the patient or I move, it won't go deep into the underlying structures. This patient kept nice and still. I'm talking to her all the time to distract and reassure her and assess her mood. I then focus on keeping the syringe barrel nice and still and avoid pulling the needle out while I apply suction to the syringe. If the needle comes out, don't panic. Watch what I do when I pull the needle out at the end of this clip. Watch the bubbles of gel appear in the needle. It can take a few seconds for this to occur, but if the ganglion is very small, all the gel may just remain in the green needle and you won't see this. I continue as a ganglion deflates until I feel I can aspirate no more contents. I then use a tissue to help express as gently as I can any more gel trapped so it's as empty as possible. I apply a plaster and give patient wound care advice such as keep it dry for 12 hours and avoid soaking it. Please avoid mud wrestling for 48 hours and any concerns about infection or redness, contact me as soon as you can. And I'm happy to review her if the need arises. I'm now going to give the unedited version of that video. See how long it takes me and what I do. And put in the comment section the one thing I tell you to do that I don't do in this video. Okay, so keep nice and still. So what we do is we small sharp scratch. No, small sharp scratch. One, two, three, sharp scratch. Keep nice and still. And then what you do is you just wait. You're right, not too sharp. Is it very sharp? It is sharp, but... Just coming out, okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna Ooh, squeeze that it. That looks disgusting. Yeah. Interesting. We've got to squeeze all the gunge out that we can. If you use this video to pluck up courage to try your first aspiration of ganglion, please let me know in the comments section below how it went and how you felt and how the patient felt. Until next week, 
Nanu Nanu. Training a primary care dermoscopist for every general practice.